Welcome everybody. My name is Marc Carrier and I'm one of the hematologists in Ottawa. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the Ken Vector National Thrombosis Seminars. And as you're probably aware, because we started that in September, the Ken Vector National Thrombosis Seminars are monthly seminars that are hosted live throughout the academic year and featuring state-of-the-art thrombosis and venous thromboembolic type of diseases lectures presented by both Canadian and international experts. Uh, is, this will be recorded and the recording will be available online uh, on the Kent Vector website. And uh, the Kent Vector National Thrombosis Seminars is a self-approved group learning activity under Section 1 as defined by the Maintenance of Certification Program of the Royal College of Physician and Surgeons of Canada. The, these rounds have a, a planning committee and it's chaired by uh, Dr. Agnes Lee and a number of members, Dr. Skeet, Dr. Kimpton, Dr. Koulian, Dr. Beringat, myself and uh, Ms. Nicole Langlois are helping to come up with the scheduling for these rounds uh, and uh, the topic and the presenters. So uh, today we have a great presentation on the topic of uh, malignancy screening in patients with unprovoked VTE and that relationship between thrombosis and cancer. So I will entertain you on screening for cancer and unprovoked venous thromboembolic disease first. And then we have the pleasure and honor to have Dr. Patricia Lea that will discuss mechanisms of thrombosis in cancer patients, and I'll introduce her more formally after the first presentation. So if you have any questions, please send them along. We will have a 15 minutes Q&A period after the end of both presentations. You can submit questions at any time throughout the seminars using the Q&A on the platform, and I'll review them and uh, generate a little bit of discussion after the presentations. So without further ado, uh, let's start. This is a younger and better looking picture of me. Uh, and uh, I'm a nematologist in Ottawa. I do venous thromboembolic disease uh, for a living. And I'll have the pleasure to entertain you on screening for occult cancer um, in patients with venous thromboembolic disease, but specifically patients with unprovoked events. And before starting, it's important to have a look at uh, potential conflicts of interest. So these are my COIs for the presentations. And over the next 20, 25 minutes, I want to do three things with you guys. The first thing is I want to describe the rates of occult cancer detection following venous thromboembolic disease. Uh, what's the rate for unprovoked, provoke? Uh, if we feel that it's high enough, should we try to screen patients for occult cancer? And if so, what would be the appropriate screening strategy? Is it something that is more limited or something that is more extensive in nature? And then at the end, when we have a look at the data, what is currently recommended in clinical practice guidelines and guidance from different nat and national and international society, um, discuss risk stratification and uh, other modalities that are up and coming, what's up and coming, and what is Ken Vector working on on that specific topic? What will be the next step? So I think in order to really have a good understanding of that clinical question and topic about occult cancer detection in patients with venous thromboembolism, it's really important to have a look at the past. So what type of rates, what type of screening strategies were we using? because the past is important because it's modulated, it's modulating what we're actually doing in the present and having a look, having a look at the recent data, having a look at what's currently recommended in clinical practice guidelines, and then what's the future? What are the trials? What are the next step? What are the new trials up and coming? What are we wanting to do and for which patient population? So for these different steps, present, past, present, and future, I'll try to go through the prevalence. So we'll start with the past. I'll go through the prevalence. What did we think was the prevalence of the disease not so long ago? How did that influence the type of screening? How did that influence clinical practice guidelines? Uh, 
Um, and then we'll move on into the present and see where we're at now and what we're actually doing. So we wouldn't be able to talk about occult cancer detection in patients with venous thromboembolic disease without showing a, a picture of Professor Armand Trousseau, who has popularized or made cancer-associated thrombosis on the medical map. He's not the first one that has described the relationship between cancer and thrombosis, but is one that is often referred to as uh, the one that has done so. What's important and interesting for us, not for Professor Trousseau, but what's interesting about him is that he actually had an upper extremity uh, proximal deep vein thrombosis, if you read his memoir, and actually died of stomach cancer uh, a few months after. So not only did he actually describe the phenomenon, but really lived it per se, and had a venous thromboembolic disease that led to an occult cancer detection. And as you can just think as clinicians, if we think that we can have signs, clinical signs that maybe our patients have cancer, that's really appealing. And we want to, if we can find a high risk population, maybe we want to look into that a, a little bit more. And what is the prevalence of occult cancer detection in patients with venous thromboembolic disease? Well, it can certainly be the early signs of an occult cancer, but what's actually the prevalence? If you look at the systematic review and meta-analysis that looked at the medical literature all the way up to 2008, and you stratify uh, the prevalence based on if the clot was provoked or unprovoked in nature, you can see that folks that have an unprovoked venous thromboembolic disease, so proximal lower limb deep vein thrombosis and PE, had a high risk of having a cold cancer detection. So one in 10, patients with unprovoked VTE uh, had a occult cancer diagnosis within the next 12 months following the VTE diagnosis. So one in 10 is quite of high. And that led to uh, clinicians really looking into that uh, a little bit more. Now, what's the long-term risk of having occult cancer if you have a, a VTE? Well, it seems to be really front-loaded. And this is well illustrated here by a case control study by Pablo Prandoni and colleagues where all patients that had venous thromboembolic events were treated with six months of anticoagulation, and then they were followed over time for incidents of occult cancer detection. And the cases were obviously those with symptomatic VTE and controls were uh, folks without VTE. And you can see that the two curves are very similar after the initial six months. Uh, and therefore, you know, ammunition or maybe an argument to say that if you were going to be found or if you go, were going to find a, a cold cancer in patients with unprovoked VTE, it seems to be front loaded probably within the first six to 12 months. And um, when we look at the underlying reason, so as I mentioned, clinicians, it seems to be appealing to be wanting to try to find that cancer, right? We always prefer to make errors of commission and omission. Why, why is it appealing to us? Well, we think that if we can find that cancer sooner, it probably will lead to, you know, more curable type of cancers being found and therefore decreasing morbidity and decreasing mortality for these cancers. You could argue that the treatment of VTE may be tailored a little bit differently if you know that they have underlying cancer. But on the flip side, why would you not want to do it? Well, as soon as you have a new diagnosis of VTE and you're talking to a patient, as soon as you present or discuss the word cancer, you're obviously causing anxiety. You may do additional testing that may lead to unnecessary additional investigation because of incidental findings. So, you know, putting a bit more anxiety to patients. And there's obviously cost associated to it. So the risk and benefit of the intervention is a little bit unclear, uh, but given that you know 10% of folks with unprovoked VTE may have an occult cancer diagnosis all the way back to 2008, you know you can see that investigators and clinicians they would want to look into different ways to diagnose these, and for a reason or another, when we think about types of screening strategies for occult cancer detection in the VTE literature. 
it's categorized or stratified in two different strategies. It's limited, which is usually your history, physical examination, basic blood work, and a chest X-ray, and more extensive. So that's a combination of a limited cancer screening strategy plus or in combination with a CT abdomen pelvis, ultrasound of the abdomen, tumor markers, PET scans. And all the literature that we're going to review today is always looking at either a limited cancer screening strategy or a more extensive one that is a combination of a limited and additional in investigations. And when you look at all the medical literature using the same systematic review and meta-analysis, if you looked at all the medical literature published all the way up to 2008, and you look at what's the incremental value of adding additional diagnostic testing to a limited screening strategy, you can see that CT abdomen pelvis was the best bang for your buck. So doing CT abdomen pelvis to patients with unprovoked VTE seems to be associated with a statistically significant increased risk of having a cold cancer detection or more so than ultrasound abdomen pelvis or different tumor markers. And that led to incorporation in clinical practice guidelines. There's no randomized control trial. These are observational, often non-randomized studies, but that led to incorporation into some clinical practice guidelines. And this is why we do certain things. So the ACCP back then, if you look at the versions before 2008 didn't really have any recommendation for a cold cancer detection. But if you look at the NICE guidelines from the United Kingdom, they would recommend that all patients diagnosed with unprovoked VTE should be offered a limited screening strategy and in patients over 40, a CT abdomen pelvis and a mammography for a woman was also suggested. And this is based on the NICE guidelines in 2012. And that's the reason why a lot of us before 2012 and sometimes more recently thought, well, if we're going to look at occult cancer uh, for patients with VTE, the money is in the belly and we should do some form of diagnostic imaging in the belly. And that's based on this data. So what are the take home message from the past? Past meaning up to 2008. Well, the prevalence of occult cancer is about 10%. So one in 10 patients with unprovoked VT will have cancer diagnosed within the next 12 months. The risk seems to be similar to the non-VT population after the initial six to 12 months. So the risk is front loaded. So if you want to do an intervention and try to find him, it's early on. And then occult cancer screening using CT abdomen pelvis may be reasonable in high-risk patient based on the data we had to look at and clinical practice guidelines recommendations. Now, 2008 was 12 years ago. What is currently happening or what, what type of data do we have since then? It's important to, again, look at the prevalence to see has it changed compared to 2008 or older data. Do we have more data looking at type of screening? Is there randomized controlled trial data now available? and what's the clinical guidance around it. So since 2008, there's been a number of randomized controlled trial and non-randomized prospective studies that have been published. And this was summarized in a systematic review and meta-analysis that's published in 2017. And if you pull the data together, it looks like the prevalence of occult cancer detection is much lower these days compared to what it was in the past. Remember, we used to say in 2008, and that's what's in the medical textbook, one in 10. Now we're no longer talking one in 10, we're talking about one in 20. So the 12 month period prevalence using the most recent data is about 5%. It's not about the 10% that was previously reported. It seems like the risk is still front loaded. And if you follow the patients beyond the initial one year of follow-up, uh, the underlying risk of a cold cancer detection is, again, much lower, about 1%, and probably not that different compared to the general population based on age and gender. And therefore, you know, again, if you are thinking about uh, looking for a cold cancer, it should be right around the diagnosis of the VTE. Now, we mentioned in the past, or reasons from the past, that CT abdomen pelvis was helping to statistically diagnose more 
lumps or more cancer, but I didn't say anything about decreasing morbidity and mortality, which is at the end of the day what we're trying to do as physicians. So it's still unknown if extensive screening strategy using these CT abdomen pelvis or other modalities improve survival or uh, decrease cancer-related morbidity or increase quality of life. It, all this may just be lead time bias or length time bias. Now in our clinics, you know, we could say there's some back in the past, well, we used CT abdomen pelvis, but it's important to say that, well, CT abdomen pelvis comes with radiation exposure. It's the equivalent of 234 chest x-rays and, and 34 mammograms. So it's important that you pick up more cancers that you create more cancers with your diagnostic screening strategy. And we never talked about, remember in the pros and cons, we said, well, maybe if we do extensive, maybe we'll have uh, a lot of incidentalomas that can lead to more biopsies. So the clinical impact and cost associated with these false positive findings or these incidentalomas are still unknown. And that despite all that, you know, some suggesting in some clinical practice guidelines that it should have been the case. So what we want to avoid, of course, is to finding lumps that are expensive, but more importantly, that are not decreasing morbidity or mortality for our patient population. So there's been, since 2008, a number of observational studies, randomized controlled trials that have a look at this question because it was felt there was still some clinical equipoise. The first study is the Trousseau study uh, from the uh, Netherlands, 630 patients with unprovoked VTE, not randomized, but center specific. So, so certain centers were just doing the limited screen, whereas others were doing an extensive screening strategy. So the limited screen in combination with a diagnostic strategy that included uh, CTs. And you can see that when they followed patients over time, over five years, there was no difference in overall mortality. Uh, there is no difference in the rate of occult cancer detection at baseline no difference in missed cancers during follow-ups. And therefore, the Tuso study was probably the really first study saying, well, wait a minute, although clinical practice guidelines are saying that we should maybe consider uh, some form of extensive screening strategy, maybe using a CT abdomen pelvis, we don't see this materializing into hard outcomes when we actually do uh, observational studies, interventional studies that are prospective in nature. The SOM trial was a randomized control trial, so Canadian data, so we should be proud of it. 854 patients with unprovoked VTE, but they were randomized to a limited cancer screening strategy that included what we discussed about, but also included age and gender specific screening, which is what patients should be getting anyway, independent if they had a VTE or not. So that was for breast, cervical, and prostate cancer. So they were randomized to that limited occult cancer screening strategy, or a more extensive one that combined a limited one, but also in combination with a CT abdomen pelvis. And the aim of the SOM trial was trying, you know, if the money is in the belly, we'll try to do the best CT abdomen pelvis that we can. So it was a really comprehensive CT that included virtual colonoscopy, gastroscopy, uh, and a, a biphasic enhanced CD of the liver. I did uh, you know, somewhat the virtual cystoscopy as well, looked at the pancreas very carefully. So really trying to uh, pick up as many cancers as possible. And the primary outcome of the SOM trial was missed cancers doing follow-up, 12-month follow-up. And you can see here on the top, the primary outcome measure, you can see that there is no difference in missed cancers between the two study arms, actually a little bit more in those that receive extensive screening strategy with an absolute difference of 0.25 with the upper bound of the 95% confidence interval that is well below the 3% that was the MCID. So really confirming that a CT abdomen pelvis for this pre primary uh, outcome uh, was not really helpful or effective in finding more or missing less cancers. Now, it didn't make a difference in finding more cancers at the baseline either. That was not statistically significant. And if you go one step further, there is no difference in early cancer detection, 
there's no difference in overall survival or cancer-related survival. So no really differences when patients are randomized to the number of lumps that are picked up or missed, and certainly no differences if these are captured that it led to decreased morbidity and mortality over time. So really saying that probably CT abdomen pelvis is not the right diagnostic mortality if we want to find these cancer. The second trial that was uh, done at the same time is the MVTEP trial. And that's a French trial that went through the French network and they randomized close to 500 patients to something very similar, a limited occult cancer screening strategy that was about the same as the SOM trial and also included age and gender specific screening or the intervention, the limited cancer screening in combination with uh, PET. And their primary outcome was slightly different. So their primary outcome was not miss cancer during follow-up. By the way, they followed patients for 24 months. It was a cold cancer detection at the time of the intervention. And you can see here that although they didn't see, they saw an absolute difference of 3.6% with PET, it was not statistically significant, but their secondary outcome measure of missed cancers over time showed an absolute difference of 4%. So you're missing less cancers if you have a PET compared to limited screening strategy. And that was statistically significant, but were the secondary outcome measure. Nonetheless, they didn't see any difference in early cancers, overall survival or cancer-related survival. So that's important. So they detecting more lumps, but the trial was not big enough to see if that led to, you know, important outcome for our patients. So based on that, uh, Dr. Deluc from Ottawa spearheaded the ISTH guidelines on occult cancer detection and suggested and recommended that patients with unprovoked VT should only undergo a limited cancer screening, which includes medical and physical, basic blood work, and age and gender specific screening, and recommend that future clinical trials are required to assess the risk and benefit of extensive occult cancer screening, specifically in a high risk group, right? Because the MVTEP trial and the SOM trial, remember, were powered to detect in the folks that had a limited screening of about 10%. But we saw from the early data, we're no longer at 10%, we're only at 5%. So maybe the money is into finding the high risk group and doing the intervention in these people. Now, something we often hear about was what about recurrent unprovoked VTE? You know, patients that had a clot in the past that coming in with a new or recurrent event. Well, there's a prospective cohort study from uh, Dr. Deluc participated from the French WIT network, following patients with recurrent unprovoked within two years. And you can see that the cumulative incidence rate is 9.2%, so closer to what we saw in the past. So these patients might be at higher risk of occult cancer detection, especially those that have recurrent VTE while they are on anticoagulation. So how do we interpret this? Well, probably there's no data more than this, so probably same as occult cancer screening, so limited plus age and gender. But, you know, as a clinician, keep a lower threshold for cancer detection, because especially if your patient had a recurrent event despite anticoagulation, the, uh, the, the risk of having occult cancer detection in the next 12 to 24 months seems to be relatively high. So take home message from the presence. The prevalence of occult cancer detection is not as high as 10%. It's much lower, half, about 5%, 1 in 20. And patients with unprovoked VTE currently should undergo a limited cancer screening using basic blood work and agent specific, uh, gender specific cancer screening. Now, what about the future? Can we stratify patients according to their underlying risk of having occult cancer detection? Can we do an intervention in these folks? Well, the systematic review and meta-analysis that was done using the early date, the later data from 2008 until 2017 still show that if you do an extensive screening strategy, you still have an increased risk of having occult cancer detection by about twofold. So twofold higher probability of having a, a occult cancer detection. So it's still working, but maybe we just need to find the right population. And independent on the subgroup, so this was a uh, an individual patient meta-analysis. So they were able to really look at the granularity of the data, trying to come up with different uh, 
risk factors and, and hemoglobin levels and all that. At the end of the day, only age seems to be uh, a discriminating factor for a called cancer detection. And they reported a 12-month prevalence in patients that are over 50 years old of 6.7%, so in between the 5 and 10% or so. So based on this, folks are now looking at other diagnostic modalities in the high-risk patients. So uh, the Plateau VTE was a prospective cohort study led by the Netherlands looking at liquid biopsies and looking at educated platelets to see if we could you know, help to predict who is likely or more likely to have uh, occult cancer within the next 12 months. And closer to home, the SOM2 and MVTEP2 trial is now up and running and had recent RAB up and running in France and uh, almost ready to start enrolling in Canada. We're looking at age as a cutoff, so patients over 50 years old, where we expect the rate of occult cancer detection to be around 7%, and then randomizing them uh, to the limited screening intervention or the limited screening in combination with PET with the primary outcome measure of being missed cancers. Uh, and then following patients for 12 months. So this is led here by Aurélien Deluc in Canada and uh, Philippe Robin in France. It's a combination of both countries because the sample size in order to detect morbidity and mortality has to be higher as we discussed. So we need more patients and we committed to uh, enroll 50% uh, of patients on both sides of the Atlantic. So overall, what I wanted to do uh, was just briefly have a discussion about the prevalence. It's lower than what uh, we used to, but it's it's still higher than it is for the general population. So we need to maintain a low threshold for suspicion of cancer. Uh, routine screening with comprehensive CT is not the right thing to do. Right now, limited screening alone, and we're awaiting results of the SOM2 and VTEP2 and the Plato VT study to move the field forward. I think we're lucky with Ken Vector to be able to participate in these in Denver. And without further ado, uh, what I'll do is I'll introduce the next speaker. So I have the great pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Patricia Liao, and she's a full professor at McMaster University in the Division of Hematology and Thromboembolism. Her research lab is associated with Thrombosis and Atherosclerosis Research uh, Institute, the Tahari. Her overall research interest is to study the mechanics the mechanistic links between blood coagulation, inflammation, and innate immunity with focus on translational studies in thrombosis, sepsis, and trauma. Her current research focus is on three key areas, extracellular DNA as a novel link between coagulation, inflammation, and innate immunity in sepsis, and biochemical and genetic determinants of thrombosis, and finally, mechanism of thrombosis in cancer patients. With great pleasure, Dr. Leah, welcome and thank you for presenting. Thank you, Mark, for the kind introduction. I would like to thank Cam Vector as well as Dr. Agnes Lee and Jesse Michelov for the invitation uh, to speak today at this forum. So I'll be talking about mechanisms of thrombosis in cancer patients. And I just wanted to highlight uh, the main learning objectives. So these include uh, discussions of how Verkhaus triad contributes to thrombosis in cancer patients, how do immune cells promote thrombosis in the setting of cancer, and how do anti-cancer therapies contribute to the hypercoagulable state. There are several clinical factors associated with the increased risk of cancer-associated thrombosis, and this can be divided broadly into three areas. So cancer-related factors include the primary site of the cancer and the type of cancer, um, the stage. There are also patient-related factors. So for example, older age, biological sex, ethnicity, also comorbidities such as presence of obesity or atherothrombotic disease, history of VTE or inherited thrombophilia, and then there are treatment-related factors. So this would be due to major surgery, uh, prolonged immobilization, and use of anti-cancer therapies, as well as central venous catheters. So we can think of um, the risk in cancer patients um, as per Verkhaus triad, in which um, 
the combination of stasis, vessel wall injury, as well as a hypercoagulable state all contribute to the development of thrombosis. So we'll first focus on stasis, which may be associated with prolonged bed rest, for example, after major surgery, and also compression of blood vessels by tumors. So what's the link between blood stasis and thrombosis? Part of this may be due to the prolonged um, hypoxia that is induced with stasis. We know that hypoxia can induce um, transcription factors such as HIF-1 as well as EGR-1. It can also mo activate monocytes. So for example, um, it can upregulate cell surface tissue factor, which can initiate the extrinsic pathway of clotting. Monocytes also release pro-inflammatory cytokines, which will then activate endothelial cells to express adhesion molecules, as well as release von Willebrand factor to attract platelets. And also the release of PI-1 is an inhibitor of clot lysis. There are many studies that have looked at the link between stasis and thrombosis. This is a nice paper by von, Wills, von Brühl's group, which showed that monocytes, neutrophils, as well as platelets work cooperatively, not only in the initiation phase, but also the propagation phase of thrombosis. This is a IVC uh, stasis model. And you can see on the left, the intact endothelium pre-ligation. And then on the right, you can see after six hours of inducing stasis, there are platelets as well as fibrin, but also leukocytes as well as extracellular DNA. And administration of the DNA through enzymatic uh, di administration of DNAs, which is an enzyme that will degrade the, the chromatin scaffold of neutrophil extracellular traps can suppress DBT growth. These are um, images of human thrombi where you can see that um, there are leukocytes as well as platelets. And these are thrombi that have been surgically obtained from patients with pulmonary embolism. And in the right, there is diffuse extracellular DNA staining indicating the presence of um, nucleic acids within the thrombus itself. So this leads to immunothrombosis, uh, which is a concept that links the innate immune system with coagulation and with inflammation. So in the context of sterile inflammation, such as VTE or cancer-associated thrombosis, there's a re release of damage-associated molecular patterns, also known as DAMPs, which can induce monocyte tissue factor expression and also release tissue factor-bearing microparticles from monocytes. There are certain enzymes released from activated neutrophils, such as neutrophil elastase, which can degrade endogenous natural anticoagulants, such as tissue factor pathway inhibitor and antithrombin. The chromatin that is released by activated neutrophils bind to von Willebrand factor as well as histones, thereby recruiting and activating platelets. And then platelets themselves can actually facilitate um, mitosis through the interaction of platelet P-selectin with PSGL1 on the surface of neutrophils. And then the polyphosphates that are released from activated platelets also participate in coagulation through autoactivation of factor 12A, which initiates the intrinsic pathway of coagulation. This uh, slide just summarizes some of our CAM vector funded studies in immunothrombosis. And I just wanted to highlight four major areas so we're interested in how various components of neutrophil extracellular traps can modulate coagulation, impair fibrinolysis, and induce cell death. We're also looking at natural and therapeutic inhibitors of mitosis as well as net components. And in animal studies, we're identifying strategies to remove the DNA scaffold of nets um, through enzymatic digestion, for example, with administration of DNAs1, or also neutralizing histones, which are cytotoxic and are able to activate platelets. So we're neutralizing some of the harmful effects of histones with heparin. And then we also have interest in how these components may have prognostic utility for disseminated intravascular coagulation, as well as sepsis.
So in terms of Verkau's triad in patients with cancer, um, there have been many studies that have looked at the effect of anti-cancer drugs on vessel wall injury, and also its ability to promote a hypercoagulable state. So in our group, we've done several studies that have looked at some of the procoagulant effects of anti-cancer therapies. So for example, we looked at lung cancer chemotherapy agents, and we've shown that on endothelial cells, as well as on monocytes, um, these platinum-based chemotherapy agents can induce um, tissue factor decryption. So it's basically a mechanism to convert tissue factor from a, a non-procoagulant form to one that is able to initiate coagulation. So there are two major mechanisms, one involving the expression of phosphatidylserine, and then the other one that is through PDI mediated decryption through disulfide uh, bond formation. And we found that some of the lung cancer chemotherapy agents can induce um, PDI dependent tissue factor decryption. We've also looked at the chemotherapy metabolite acrolein, which uh, we've shown to induce uh, thrombin generation in a plasma-based system. And it also can impair natural anticoagulant pathways in animal-based as well as cell-based models. Here are some images, some figures from the paper where we showed that the presence of acrolein can induce phosphatidylserine expression as well as tissue factor exposure on endothelial cells. And in reference to breast cancer chemotherapy agents, um, this is a paper by Laura Swiston and Sean Mukherjee. They've demonstrated that if you take whole blood and you expose it to epirubicin and you extract the amount of DNA that's released by the blood cells, that the DNA can initiate a thrombin generation through the contact system. We also found that um, in breast cancer chemotherapy patients, 20, 24 hours after the administration of chemotherapy, we see elevated increases in DNA, which correlates with the uh, procoagulant potential of the plasma from these pa cancer patients. In healthy mice, we found that injection of various uh, chemotherapy agents, so in this case, we're looking at epirubicin, um, increase not only um, the DNA levels, but also thrombin, antithrombin complexes. And this was measured six to 48 hours post chemotherapy treatment. We also found that um, in vitro, epirubicin as well as doxorubicin, so these are both anthracyclines, can induce the release of DNA from neutrophils, but not from other cells such as endothelial cells, monocytes, or breast cancer um, cell lines. And then finally, we've also demonstrated that lung cancer chemotherapy agents can also induce the release of tissue factor positive as well as phosphatidylserine positive uh, microparticles from various cells, including um, lung cancer cells. So then there are also procoagulant effects of um, the cancer cells themselves. This table summarizes the relative risk of BTE in hospitalized cancer patients. And you can see that uh, the odds ratio is highest in those with hematological cancers. There are also um, high odds ratio for those with lung cancers, cancers of the GI tract, as well as the brain. There are tumor-specific procoagulant effects. So for example, um, tumor-derived tissue factor positive microparticles can promote um, thromp coagulation and also activate platelets. The activated platelets through the expression of P-selectin interacting with PSGL1 on neutrophils can accelerate mitosis as well. And then many components of the neutrophil extracellular traps, as we mentioned earlier, can activate um, coagulation and also induce endothelial cell death and cause platelet activation as well. And finally, there are tumor-specific molecules such as GCSF, which help to prime neutrophils for um, subsequent mitosis and also interleukin-8, which has been shown to accelerate mitosis as well.
This is a nice summary of some of the procoagulant effects in pancreatic cancer cells. So again, you have the release of um, tissue factor positive microvesicles, which can accelerate the extrinsic pathway of coagulation. And then you also have um, the production of protoplanin, which is a molecule that can activate platelets via the CLEC2 receptor. Mucins are large glycoproteins that are secreted by tumor cells and they can bind to selectins and also activate platelets. Um, there's also heparinases, which will remove the heparin sulfate uh, moieties of the glycocalyx, thereby um, inhibiting its ability to catalyze antithrombin-mediated inhibition of coagulation factors. And then finally, PI-1 secreted from tumors can, inhibit, can inhibit fibrinolysis. Here's a immunohistochemistry of nets in small cell lung cancer. So what you see on the left is intense staining of nets within the foci of cancer tissues. So that's shown here by the arrow. And then the, um, the adjacent tissues are shown here with the arrow head. Um, on the right is a higher magnification and you can see in red um, staining for histone DNA complexes. And then the blue is the counter stain for DAPI, which stains for the nuclei of cells. So this leads to a nice um, summary table that was um, produced by Nodule Keys Group, which highlighted novel potential therapeutic strategies for cancer associated thrombosis. So these include use of anti human tissue factor monoclonal antibodies, as well as antiplatelet therapies. Um, heparinase has also been studied in animal models as well. And in terms of nets, there are ways to dismantle nets, for example, through recombinant human DNAs one, and then inhibition of podoplanin, as well as um, oral inhibitors of PI-1, which have been used in um, which have been shown to block bevacizumab induced thrombosis in a human lung adenocarcinoma bearing mice. So just wanted to conclude this presentation with a summary of Verkhaus triad in cancer patients, um, stasis related to prolonged immobilization and also compression of the tumor vessels, of the blood vessels by the tumors, the presence of anti-cancer agents, and I focus mainly on the work that we've done with chemotherapy drugs, and then also studies that have shown that there are um, tumor-specific procoagulant molecules as well. And I just wanted to thank uh, Cam Vector for uh, ongoing support for funding some of these studies, uh, not only for operating budgets, but also for many of the scholarships that the trainees in our lab have received and it's also funding from CIHR. Just wanted to thank um, previous grad students who have worked on the chemotherapy and thrombosis studies, and then the current students who have looked at um, mechanisms of immunothrombosis in cell-based models and also in animal studies. And that's it for me, I'm happy to... So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. That's a fantastic publication. I've received two questions uh, to date, but if you have any questions, you can uh, uh, go into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and, and include your question. The two question, one is for you, Patricia, and one's for me. The first one is uh, one of the participants was uh, quite interested in in, um, in in your work that is, I guess, funded by Ken Vector about the uh, prognosis of nets in, in patients with uh, um, DIC that you, what you've been working on. Do you think there's a do you think there's a role for prognostication with nets and cancer associated thrombosis as well? Um, I think there would be in terms of prog because DIC um, is also I mean one of the underlying causes of DIC could be cancer itself. So the DIC right. study that we published, which showed that citrullinated citrullinated histone H3, which is released from um, neutrophils undergoing mitosis, that was a prognostic marker for sepsis-associated DIC. So we haven't looked at um, 
you know, cancer associated DIC or even cancer itself. But I think that would be um, a really interesting study. And, and another question that was just sent to me by email this, it was, is there any, do you feel with all your background and knowledge about the pathophysiology, do you think there's one anticoagulant that might be better than others based on physiology for cancer associated thrombosis or should we tailor anticoagulation based on pathophysiology more than anything else? I think um, in terms of, you know, risk of efficacy or the risk of bleeding probably is going to be the deciding factor um, mm -hmm. with some of the, you know, studies that are looking at inhibiting the enzymes within the contact pathway. So for example, in, in, in inhibition of factor 11 using um, antisense oligos in the context of major um, elective knee surgery, there is um, a benefit without an increased risk of bleeding. So I think that that's probably going to be, you know, useful and relevant in the context of cancer associated thrombosis. Um, in regards to some of the studies that have done for primary prophylaxis or treatment, I'm not sure if there was subgroup analysis to look at efficacy within, efficacy within the uh, cancer patients out of the ones that were included um, in the study. I mean, mm -hmm. You might know more than me, but you know, in the, for example, in the select D or the, the, is it the Caravaggio study? Yeah, yeah. There, um, did, did they, was there a signal with certain types of cancers? The, um, it would, it would have been, I'm sure we will know. So the curve agile right now, the subgroup analysis based on tumor type is still pending and a select D was a smaller. So we, it's not very helpful because it's only 406 patients and believe it or not, the, the, um, the subgroup analysis specifically for Ocus IVT, although it's been published 18 months, what we have to date is just subgroups through uh, a publication for hematological and gastrointestinal, not more stratified than that, and it seems to be consistent with what you know the main paper has shown. So it, it's, but it's a good thought and something that we now that we have three studies, maybe we can. Um, hopefully the investigators will pull the, the, the data together and look specifically at different tumor types and see if it makes any difference. And, and you're right that the, uh, when you were talking about factor 11, so maybe that would be a nice avenue or a new indication for these products when they're, when they become available, because these patients are at high risk of having bleeding troubles. So that's, uh, thank you so much for sharing your insight on that. We have one more question before uh, I think we can close. So the, the question is about, um, can we, or can I explain the decrease in the rate of occult cancer uh, detection in patients with unprovoked VTE? Because we went from one in 10 in the early 2000 to, I guess, one in, in 20 now. And I don't really have a good answer to that other than um, two hypotheses, I guess. The first thing is the in the 2008 systematic review, there's lots of old, old studies that were included in there. And I think uh, practice has changed since then and primary care is better and, and people have screening for breast and cervical and prostate and all that. So I think there's probably a certain component of that that people don't necessarily need to wait to have their VT before they're diagnosed with uh, their underlying cancer. I think you know, we're picking up with primary care a bit more cancers and, and hopefully uh, change morbidity and mortality that way. The second thing is because of the, the 2008 systematic review included older studies, I think it included a lot of studies that included patients that, uh, you know, when you see them in clinic, you don't have a diagnosis of cancer, but, you know, they've they're cathectic and, you know, they have big ascites or, you know, you know, they smell like they have cancer. And that was not the case for those that were, or the studies that were published after 2018, because this was meant to be screening, right? So for example, if you picked up a, a lung nodule or a lung lesion on your CTPA, these were not included in MVTEP or SOM, or these were not the type of patients we're looking for, looking for, you know, 
patients otherwise healthy that have VT and then trying to do a bit more screening to them. So I think that might have led as well to a slightly lower underlying prevalence of the disease. So we don't know for sure, but these are two hypotheses that uh, may be reasonable. I have a question for you, Mark. You mentioned yeah. under the future directions that there might be um, some use in including biomarkers in the predictive analysis, um, were those determined in advance? Yeah, so the, the patient-educated platelet study from the Netherlands, they were, um, there's a lot of science behind that that I'm unfortunately quite ignorant on and I can't really uh, tell, but these were derived from different uh, type, tip, from patients with different types of tumors, and then they were able to look at the imprint of the platelet uh, encounter with the tumor cell. And apparently they can say with that liquid biopsies looking at platelet educated um, cells that they can actually say from what part of like, is it a GU or a lung or GI type of tumor, depending on the encounter with the tumor cell. It's changing the, the cellular markers. We actually participated in a number of uh, centers here in Canada to that study, and um, it's closed. They're analyzing and finishing off enrollment. So we'll have a bit more, I guess soon we should have the data because they were following patients for 12 months, but we don't know if in a, you know, in a sure, a higher risk population, but it's not cancer patients, you know, trying to use it as a screening method if it's going to be helpful. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll soon see. I hope it's answering your question a little bit. Yes, it does. Thank you. Well, uh, I think it's time for us to go back in the lab or on service or in clinic. And therefore, I would really, really want to thank uh, Dr. Patricia Liao for your great presentation today and, and taking the time to present a little bit of the data that you're doing with uh, Can Vector funding as well. It's always good to see the, the, the results of that. So thank you and thank you for presenting. And please stay tuned for the next seminar in January and complete your evaluation um, that will be sent to you by email or through the website and you have here the dates for the next webinars in the near future. Um, so thanks for joining us, uh, having lunch with us uh, through these Can Vector rounds, and hopefully you enjoyed it. Thank you, Patricia. Thanks to Jesse and Caleb for the organization, and we'll see each other in January. Thank you very much, Mark.